so um, as you know this is uh, the third sunday that we have of the uh, the penguin fdc that we're doing and where we're specializing in writing for kids and writing for young adult uh, of course the lessons that we're getting and the, the the wisdom that we're getting from all our conversations have cut across genres so while some of it is about the genre a lot of it is quite genre exhaustive ag agnostic uh, and today we have Sayoni. We always try to have somebody who's non, uh, not from the writing side of things, but who's from the publishing or you know maybe a literary agent or somebody who can give us uh, a, a little bit of a worldview of the whole publishing side of things. So uh, we have Sayoni with us. And am I saying it right? Am I saying it wrong? Well, uh, I'm a bong, so we sure things. A sure? It's a Sayoni. Yeah, so Sayoni. But we also Shayoni. assume that Perfect. the rest of Thank the you. world pronounces things as we do, so we don't add the H. No, no, no. So the Shayoni is uh, Sh Shayoni. I, uh, I'm glad I asked. So, uh, so Shayoni is, uh, has an illustrious career in publishing, and it's really a little, um, little daunting. But after having done a master's degree from Oxford University College, Oxford, she became the commissioning editor at Puffin and Ladybird, where she relaunched Puffin and Ladybird imprints in 2001. Uh, from there to Scholastic as the publishing director, then Amar Chitrakatha, short stint, about a year. Mm -hmm. um, as the publisher, and then uh, the most interesting title I've come across in a while, which was the director and primary platypus at Duckbill. So we understood a little bit more about Duckbill from um, Anushka last uh, Sunday, and that is something that you co-founded with her, right? Shaini? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. All right. And from there, then of course, Duckbill itself was uh, uh, taken in house by Penguin, and so you've been with Penguin for the past four odd years now. Four oh, years. Yeah. So. Um, so long time that you've spent in publishing so this is the this is literally the linkedin bio but uh, give us the true okay. bio give us uh, <laughs> give us your uh, personal story how did you land up in publishing was it an accident was it intent did you always know that this is what you wanted to do no it wasn't it was it was uh, it was pretty much inspired by the uh, bookshop in uh, howrah station in calcutta uh, this was in the 1990s, late 1990s, and I was a I was a, a student, and I had always thought that I would end up teaching. Uh, it was one oh. of the pro proper professions in those days, um, uh -huh. and um, I was uh, going to take a train from Calcutta to Delhi to take my flight back to England. And as I was waiting for the train, I went to the bookshop and I saw lots of orange spines. And I realized that there was actually a lot of publishing happening in India at that point. So I filed that away for some moment in time. Then due to personal circumstances, I abandoned my PhD and came back to India. And I started working in uh, Seagull in Calcutta and teaching at Lady Brabourne College in Calcutta. So I was kind of trying out both professions. And I decided that I was actually having more fun creating books. So. At that point, it was um, not really thought out, more of a slide into publishing. And children's publishing happened completely randomly because um, I, I was an editor on the adult list at Penguin at about the time that David Davidar, who was um, uh, really a, a fabulous, fabulous publisher. Um, some of you guys might know he currently runs Aleph. Uh, but yes. anyway, he wanted to restart the children's list, and I started working on it on the very, very dodgy credentials that I actually read children's books for pleasure. So um, it's been, hmm. it, it, it's really been um, a very learn through experience, meander into things kind of career, which I think a lot of young people these days do not have the luxury of. Uh, doing and i've taught a lot of publishing courses in india in over the years and i find it really interesting because you know we all learned on the job um, right and i wonder how different our experience would have been if we had actually gone in with theoretical and practical knowledge mm. we, we we literally bumbled our way through and it was <laughs> a pretty nice way of learning okay what fun Sounds uh, sounds like quite an adventure, and so um, so it was. So your first job uh, was uh, was with Penguin itself. 
Uh, well, the, my first proper job was with Penguin itself. Okay, and you mentioned uh, uh, seagulls, so you must know Sunandini then. I was pre Sunandini. Okay, because we've had Sunandini here to talk about right. cover design. Yeah. No, no, I mean, I, I, of course, know Sunandini, but I was there I, a while before her. Right, okay. And, and tell us about Duckbill. So, how did you land up becoming an editor for children's books as opposed to, you know, a writer? So, those are two separate questions. But first, tell us about Duckbill. So for many, so Anushka and I uh, became friends when she started writing this book called Moin and the Monster, which yeah. to my mind is still like one of the greatest Indian children's books ever. Yeah. And I had never met her and a friend connected us. So I read her, I, I, I had read some of her picture books for Tara and I asked her if she wanted to write something longer. So she used to, um, she said, I'll give it a shot. I've never done it. But um, she started sending me chapters of Moin and the Monster. And in, in, in that time, I used to sit, uh, because I was the only children's editor in uh, Penguin, I used to sit in the middle of the floor. So we had cabins all around where there were very serious people editing very serious books. And my space was an open cubicle in the middle. And the chapters would come in and I would read them and I would laugh so loudly that very stern looking people would come out of the um you know uh, come out of their cubicles and say you know keep it down but anyway so once a week anushka would send me those uh, chapters and then the book happened and over time we actually met and became friends we were also colleagues when i was at scholastic and mm -hmm. one of the things that we um would lament constantly was that it is always agenda driven books which uh, kind of sell more uh, the irony with children's books, of course, is that the person making the purchase is not the reader. So children are compelled to buy what their parents want them to read. A lot of the time, there are obviously yeah. room for association. But um, we both believe, and, and we did our fair share of pointless and silly books in Penguin, in sorry, in Scholastic. But we also, when you work for a large company, you have to you know, you have revenue targets and you have to follow whatever the company's principles are. So yeah. we, for several years, we talked about the fact that it should, uh, if if it is a just universe, there should be a way of sustaining a children's publishing business by doing only books which are for fun and pleasure. Mm. Um, and after several years of doing this, uh, of, of talking about it, uh, we kind of said, well, you know, we have to take the leap at some point or the other. And right. uh, we just started without, again, as most things in my life, without much thought. I'm glad we didn't give it much thought because if we had really thought about what's involved in running an independent children's pub publishing company with two people only, we would have probably not done it. But we didn't think about yeah. it. So we did it. And once you do it, you make it work. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. That's so much fun. And how come? So so I know that you wrote uh, Piss Puss Boom, which is such a fun name for a book. And you co-wrote that with Jerry. Uh, yeah. and, and Anushka. And Anushka. Yes, I saw that. So it's three uh, three stories, is it? One it's in Bengal, one in Goa. Yes, three stories about uh, grandparents and all being resolved by a fart. <laughs> OK, that sounds yeah poetic. So uh, tell us a little bit more about that book. Well, again, that book happened because it was, I, I, I wish I could say that we uh, sat down together and we decided that, uh, you know, we needed more farts in children's literature, but it actually wasn't that. It was driven completely by uh, the economics of the situation, which is that uh, we were setting out. We, Jerry is a good friend, both Anushka's and mine, probably more Anushka's than mine, but you know, they have writer, writer thing, and I'm editor, so kind of slightly enemy occasionally. Uh, but Jerry sent us this story, and we like the story. And of course, as a fledgling publishing house, there is no way on earth you turn down a story by Jerry Pinto. At the same time, it was a very short story. And there was no physical way of making it into a book. 
So the only mm. thing to do was to add more stories. And since we didn't have the money to pay Jerry properly and pay an illustrator, it was required that the other st stories we got were free. So mm. how do you get free stories? Well, you write them you write yourself. Them. <laughs> yeah. Right. What fun. All right, cool. And so, so, so was editing something that you chose consciously? I mean, this was the writing thing that you almost did just because, you know, duty called. But, uh, mm. uh, but is that something that you chose consciously? I mean, is that what you enjoy more? Have you ever thought about being, a, being an author or not well, really? I, see, if you're an editor, you have to think about being an author because yeah. at some point in your life, you feel that you are essentially a leech living off other people's talent. Oh, okay. come on. So that's really uh, not uh, that's really not fair to yourself. I, it's not what I wake up every morning thinking, but uh -huh. it is true. You know, so when when uh, when authors authors are very kind people usually, and they, you know, they say you have done so much. You know, you 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 really shaped the book. I'm like, but you're the person who's written it. You know, an editor can only give feedback and comments and be helpful and, and and be mean a lot of my job involves being mean in uh, usually as nice a way as possible but occasionally not even that um so yes i i think i would love to be a writer there are many failed novel openings sitting in my laptop but um <laughs> okay. hasn't happened maybe it'll happen someday but if if i if i um if I have a dream, and yeah, obviously I have many dreams, but um, the chief dream would be to be able to write a book. I just think, I just think the discipline necessary to finish a book is something quite awesome, which is why you know even um, even when I'm rejecting a manuscript, and I do reject a lot of manuscripts, somewhere there there is enormous respect for this person who has managed to do what I have never managed to do, which is finish writing a book. It requires mm. guts and commitment of a level which uh, <laughs> clearly I don't possess at this point in time. And and you mentioned earlier that you learned editing on the job, but Completely. you know when, when you're like, but 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 when you're like sort of so dismissive of editors, you know some really big names come to mind. It's like Tay Hohoff, she made uh, you know um, To Kill a Mockingbird what it what it was. Max Perkins is the guy who's actually supposed to have made. Scott Fitzgerald into whatever. And we talk about Jerry. I mean, I, I met Jerry and I was saying, which house do you publish with? And he just said Ravi Singh. He said, Ravi whichever Singh house Ravi Singh. Yeah. So he said, yes. wherever Ravi Singh is, that's where I publish. When he was yeah. with Penguin, I published with Penguin. Now it's uh, Sle uh, Speaking Tiger. So I'm with Speaking Tiger. I don't publish with a company. I publish with, absolutely. with Ravi Singh. Right? No, no, that is so absolutely I think, true. And editor yeah. and authors move with editors because yeah. uh, it's just, that is where your trust relationship is. Yeah, of course. And I'm just saying that because I think, you know, editors are incredibly, incredibly important people. And I think an editor's job is probably more difficult in some ways than a writer's job because writers, we have to write, but you have to parse and you have to, you know, <laughs> get people with big egos to make changes to stuff they've created. Now, that's not something that's easy to do. So, so yeah. I, I, I'll tell you one, one thing I've seen over the years, though. Uh, usually, the better the writer, um, and and clearly, I'm talking commercial success here because sure. you know every writer has their own own, own space yeah. and standards yeah. of excellence. The better the writer, the easier they are to edit. Uh, not in term, the the easier they are accepting editorial feedback because I think um, okay. they see it as a. Um, I think they genuinely recognize that there is it there is engagement with their work and an outside eye is very valuable and and you know they don't cling yeah. that much to the words that they've written uh, the most mm. difficult editing uh, experience i've had um and i'm obviously not going to name who it is uh was with a very very well known writer this was when i was still editing for the adult listed penguin and uh, I got this really big name writer to edit. And I was, you know, one part of me, and I was quite young at that point, one part of me was thrilled that, you know, I've been thought worthy of editing this writer. As the process went on, I realized that 
uh, my seniors, including Ravi Singh, had handed over this hot potato with to me <laughs> because this guy just did not accept changes. Okay, and I worked. I worked really hard on that. I was, I was um, deeply conscientious for many, many reasons, and he just dismissed everything I did. And every once in a while, when I was sitting with him and arguing, those were the days when one sat with one's authors and argued edits. Uh, he would say, it's strange that you say this because, you know, my editor in the UK is also saying this. And I was like, you idiot. If two <laughs> people are telling you this, just listen to us. <laughs> but yeah, so, so again. Uh, so you I still didn't get it? Place, no. I mean, occasionally, <laughs> I, I still have that book up there. But um, occasionally when I read it, you know, it was a very good book, but it could have been a better book. Okay, cool. What fun. All right. And uh, so so that's interesting. So you've edited both adult work and kids kids books. Yes. So what's the what's uh, tell us about the kids books and books for grown ups and how are they different from an editor's perspective? What do you look for in terms of how how do you change a book for or what's the difference in a kid's book and a, and a grown up's book? Um so one of the things I absolutely uh, believe in is that um, children are equally if not more intelligent than adults the only difference is that they probably know less of the world because they haven't lived long enough and read enough but they they know things they know a lot of things which we don't understand things intuitively which we didn't when we were growing up because the world was a different place. And um, I don't know if any of you have ever had to ask children on your children or nieces or nephews for help with death, but it can make you feel like a real idiot. Um, and also they are so formidably well informed. You know, when I when I look back at myself at age 17, and I have a 17-year-old son, uh, so if you hear cries of pain during the course of this, it's he's you know, being beaten up at some game or the other. Uh, the level of uh, information about the world that children today have is really humbling. So when you are editing an adult book, you can make this assumption that the person who's reading it is uh, possibly of more or less the same intelligence level that you are. When you're editing a children's book, you have to be aware that the person who's going to read it is possibly more intelligent than you are, which makes it a bit scary. Uh, I don't think that there is essentially any difference between editing a book for adults and children, except A, this awareness, and B, depending on um, the age group, and I'd like to talk a little bit about age groups later, depending on the age group for which you are, um, for the book, which is intended to be the book's primary readership, you might have to look at vocabulary. Uh, though mm. more than vocabulary, I think it is sentence structure which is more important. Okay, great, great. That's uh, yeah, I would I would imagine, and I agree with you about kids being smart. You're right; it's just exposure that's different. But in terms of how smart they are, sometimes it's scary. And I have two kids actually the same age, roughly. So, yeah. Um, <clears throat> the other big question, of course, which has to be asked is: there is this. I mean, everybody's talking about AI. So I just have to get it out of the way. But is it mm. impacting editing? Is is it is it like a thing? Is it showing up somehow in your workplace? Um. So there is a lot of insecurity about AI among both writers and editors. Um, yeah. I I think AI is a fabulous tool for editors at the copy editing proofreading level. Yeah. Um, I don't think that uh, it's something that we need to see as a threat. Um, certainly for an editor who's commissioning books, it's not. Because yeah. in, a, in a way, we're the anti-AI, right? We're looking at things which are different. We're looking at things which are hmm. kind of not linear, you're looking for the quirk more than the straight line. Um, and as for yeah, writers, like... no. So, so I lurk in lots of um, 
uh, writers group and my uh, secret passion is historical novels including historical romances so i found that when chat gpt started there was uh, almost hysteria in this um, children uh, not children women's historical romance writers group because they all felt that um, you know they were in peril a lot of these people self-publish on Amazon and so on. And a couple of them felt it was a very useful tool because if you're going to be a successful self-published author on Amazon, you need to produce a book every three months. One, so, yeah. So, yeah. So, so it's mixed. And I mean, there are some books which are published today which anyway sound as if they're written by AI. So <laughs> and, you, know, you, you kind of feel, okay, AI might do a slightly better job of writing this book. But mm. by and large, no. I mean, not for the next 20 years. All right, that's fun. That um, That is uh, nice. So we'll be opening it up for questions for everybody. I see there's already a lot of questions that have come into the chat. Uh, but before uh, before that, so uh, before we move, move out into the open Q&A zone, uh, so what's next now? Are you steady at Penguin? You think you're going to be there for a while? You're having fun or you never know? I'm, or having, where? I'm, having, I'm having fun. Uh, I don't know whether I'm going to be, uh, I mean, I don't know what I want to do. I am, uh, mm. I just turned 52 and I feel that this is, uh, I should, I should do something completely different. Having said which, I really, really enjoy my job. Um, okay, great. I've That's been, so lovely to hear. No, no, I, I love it. It's so much fun. And, and also, you know, you're dealing with people with ideas and, uh, it's just very exciting. I mean, I think some ways the best part of my job is reading new manuscripts by new authors or even established authors, because it's just you don't know what's there. And, you know, uh, every once in a while there is treasure. Yeah, I'm sure. So Yeah. So um, uh, seriously, as far as uh, lines of work go, I seriously lucked out. And so, so a couple of things I wanted to mention before you before we open it out to questions. Hmm. First is you you say you've been struggling to write a book. You really want to write a book? Come to the retreat because that's where people <laughs> write books. I, so I, you should I, definitely I, come. I did, and I even if you don't come for a long period of time, even if you come for a week or ten days, you'll get started. That's a guarantee. You know, so starting uh, is not the problem. I did a fabulous retreat in Goa in June with hmm. uh, five other writers, okay. and it was really good and the committed and hardworking two are now working on their new books the three of us who are procrastinators and thought a writing workshop would make us move have written exactly three chapters during the six days of the workshop and then we've come back and not written another word so oh. no i i just <laughs> do so 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 when david davida wrote his first novel he would get up at 5 a.m every morning right from five to seven and or five to eight and then go to work and um, he said the only reason this happened was because his wife rachna singh uh, would make him do it so i think i need to start wooing rachna i'm not sure she'd be <laughs> open to change at this time but uh, you know i think that's the only way i'll write a book cool and the second thing i was mentioning i was thinking aloud i was thinking in my head when you were saying it was that you said that when you started Duckbill, you didn't really have a plan. And if you had thought about it very hard, you probably wouldn't have done it. I think we were the same way. If you had actually thought about this idea saying, okay, we're going to build a few rooms in the Himalayas and start expecting people to turn up and do workshops and, you know, mm -hmm. make it a viable enterprise, uh, it mm -hmm. would never have happened. But, uh, but yeah, it's kind of been the same way that, you know, I think because we got in with our eyes, you know, firmly in the sand, with our heads yeah. perfectly stuck in the sand. Yeah. We got away with Always it and, and it kind of worked out. Yeah, yeah, that was cool. All right, so I'm seeing a whole bunch of questions. So I'm just going to open up the chat and we can start going through them one by one. So if, if the questions don't seem like questions but comments or observations, I might just, uh, yeah. uh, I might just skip. But all right, so there's some comments about what, what a nice guy. Uh, uh, Jerry is. Uh, first question, what factors do you consider in editing a manuscript as in what are the list of priorities and pain points 
do you consider and in what order author's mindscape or world view may be utterly contrary to or abhorrent to you as an editor is that is it structural or line by line so there's a lot of questions but uh, yes. the one that i like is when an author's mindscape or world view may be utterly contrary or abhorrent to you as an editor how do you deal with that but it's good writing let's assume oh that was my, so so see i have a luxury um which is um, which is afforded to me in duckbill and even now with duckbill with penguin is that i determine my list so i publish only the books that i want to publish and that doesn't mean that it's not a good book in fact one of the really nice things in the children's publishing community is that because it's a very small community and a lot of the other editors you know we've become friends i mean we've known each other and there is no point in um, uh, you know rivalry for the sake of it so we or are pretty collaborative and cooperative so there are some books for example so you so you generally over the years you get to see what a publishing house or an editor is picking up so for example um, i'll just use this as a random example one of the things i do not publish on principle is folk tales or mythology simply because when i think there are a lot of folk tales and mythology and they're really good books out there and they sell well but it is not something because it's there i would rather explore spaces which are new but when i get a manuscript which is folk tales or mythology which i like i will happily pass it on to other editors or you know give the author the emails of editors who publish this and say you know why don't you approach that person so if a world view mindscape or world view is utterly contrarian or abhorrent to me i will not publish it right okay cool um next question what's the difference between looking for an editor for books for children versus non fiction for adults uh, is there a framework in assessing who will be a good editor for you is it just skill and expertise or does temperament play a role as well i think temperament is the most important um i think if you're looking for an editor for your work it requires a little bit of um um research because unfortunately we don't link you know list these things on linkedin but you should yeah. try to think of which book you really like and which book you think your book not not your book doesn't have to be similar to that book but it's kind of similar in spirit you know and if you see which publishing house published that and if you can find out which editor worked on that that's a good way to pitch i mean i think that's a great way of matching mm -hmm. and i don't know if you guys read the acknowledgments in books uh you must always read the acknowledgments in books it gives you a wealth of information about uh you know which editor worked on it and which publisher which publisher cuz you see the logo but which imprint and things like that which is very useful when you're pitching a book right great um next question is from parthi what do you feel about writing style for kids versus adults i always feel that shorter more succinct direct narration works for kids better than it does for adults would you agree uh not necessarily i do agree that books for kids again depending on age group need to have more clarity and shorter sentences definitely work but you can also have shorter sentences within a you know a more dispersed narrative style uh but i really think that you know story and writing style i mean the the story you're telling is so determined by the writing style that it wouldn't be the same story if you used a different writing style so i don't think that's something one can consciously decide beyond a point i mean having written a story in one style you you can make it more child friendly um through editing but i think basically when you're writing you should just write don't don't think too much about what works or doesn't work firstly the story has to be told in the way that you want to tell the story and and uh, occasionally i offend people by um, talking about non fiction also as stories but it's 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 kind of the same I mean, it's 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 fact but the way you are putting the facts together you are influencing the readership you you are telling a story through you know um uh, incontrovertible fact so it's so so in that sense both non fiction and fiction 
are stories when I'm reading them. And uh, you have to figure out what style works best for the story you're trying to tell. And that, I think, is all important. And you know, after that, you can figure out um, short, succinct sentences or things like that. Right, right. Makes sense. Um, then there's a two questions set from Stuti. First is, as an independent writer, how can I connect with a mentor or editor for getting feedback on my stories before pitching it to a publisher? Well, um, you have agents who do that. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, there are not too many agents who work with children's books in India simply because, well, there's not very much money involved. Mm. Uh, but that would be the yeah uh, i can also jump in sorry hmm. when you when you're sorry. done Shayani. i also have some suggestions for the lady yeah and yeah so that's it i would say i think peer group feedback is very important so if you have if you can form a fellowship with a couple of other writers that's fabulous feedback if you do writing workshops that again is very very useful uh, feedback. Anushka and I used to run the Duckbill workshops for several years, which was writing for children. Yeah. And uh, yeah. we got an enormous number of manuscripts from that. And uh, we also would work with people who were, we, we basically gave all the people who were on that workshop a carte blanche that anytime they wrote something, they could send it back. So it's useful to do writing workshops again, because you connect with people, you connect with potential mentors, and that is informal feedback works. Now you. Right. right. And uh, a few things I wanted to mention. So if you go to the Himalayan Writing Retreat website, there's a magnifying glass on the top right. You can search for editors. There is a, you know, our blog post is a wealth of information. So you'll find like 40, 50 editors in India and you can look through them and you can see their work. And like Shayoni said, you can see who's doing kids books or who's doing nonfiction and you can find those people. Uh, if you do a search for writing coaches, you'll be able to find writing coaches. If you search for beta readers, You'll find people who are willing to do beta reading for you. And of course, within FTC, you understand everybody's profile, in a sense, is shared with you on the tracker. If you go to the uh, second tab in the tracker, which I'll show you at the end of the session, you can find other people who might be reading your favorite author or writing your genre or living in your city. And you can connect with those folks, make a community, and hang out with these people and ask them to you know, read your work and give you feedback. So that can work very well. Uh, I'll come to her second question. What does a good pitch for a picture book for children include? Should it ideally be a full draft instead of the first couple of chapters? Okay, I'm going to get into a very annoying teacher-teacher um, uh, mode at the moment. So please excuse me for the next three minutes. So a picture book doesn't have chapters. Okay, A picture book is a book usually, I would, I would say it should have like sub- 750 words. It's for very young readers. Um, and the in a picture book, the text is ideally, uh, the, the storytelling is done both through words and pictures because very young kids can't read or you know are just learning to read. Um, after picture book, you have one nebulous category called um, early readers, which have a little bit more text, still have pictures, but still don't have chapters, don't have enough words for chapters. Uh, we do a series called Hook Books, if I don't know if you've seen them, which are which fall into that category. After that, next, uh, again, uh, one, okay, I hate the statement I'm going to say, but anyway, uh, say children roughly around the age of seven or so, disregard anything anyone ever tells you about children's age when they should be reading something, because children read at very different levels, so as we start linking age to a particular kind of book, we are doing children a grave injustice. But anyway, for the purpose of this discussion, around age seven, you can expect a child to be able to read uh, a book which may be long enough to have a few chapters. So that's when you get into chapter books. After chapter books, you have middle grade novels. After middle grade novels, you have young adult novels. And after that, the world's your oyster. Uh, so when you're submitting a pitch for a picture book, because a picture book is probably under 750 words, you should submit the whole manuscript. And you should also submit your suggestions for illustrations, because again, um, it's good to know what the author has in mind. And you should not get the book illustrated yourself, 
because that is a decision in which the publishing house would like to be involved. Ah, that's a lovely response. Thank you so much. Even my head is so much clearer about so many things. Uh, next question is a very open question. Any tips for the first round of self-editing in our draft? It seems to be across genres. Don't read it for a week. Uh, yeah, pretty much that. Right, and it's great. And it's not your child, so you can mutilate it. <laughs> yeah, that's a strong word. But yeah, you get the idea, I'm sure. Uh, next question, how do editors accept children's manuscripts, a full manuscript or an idea synopsis? What if it is a book that needs illustration? I think all these questions have already been answered. How do you approach publishing houses as a new editor? Okay. Mm -hmm. And what you is expected? You apply for a job. Sorry? You apply for a job, I mean, for a, as a new editor. We'll just have to go through HR. Yeah. And what is the expected length of a chap book for older kids and a YA novel? OK, so again, I think I, I really believe that the story should be as long as it needs to be. And often in the telling of in the writing of the story, the author may be making choices which he or she is not even aware of making. So, for example, we do get books which the author thinks is for a younger reader. And the protagonist in the book is seven years old. But um, as you're reading the manuscript, you realize that the experiences which the child is undergoing and the decisions the child is making is often uh, far more complex. So as soon as you change the protagonist's age from uh, seven to 11, the book suddenly works. So the reason for this ramble is that, um, firstly, when you're writing, please do not think of word count. Uh, secondly, and on a more prosaic note, um, <coughs> I'd say that the first chapter books that we publish would be around 5,000 words. Publish a uh, chapter book for older kids, by which I assume you mean uh, middle grade novels, can be anything from seven and up. I mean, you know, I think these notions used to be much more fixed before Harry Potter happened which of course probably happened before some of you were born. But for the rest of us who were adults at that point, it was a revelation. Everyone thought children needed to read thin books. But, you know, JK Rowling came and sold us these 700 page books, which eight year olds were reading quite happily. So there yeah. is no ideal thing. It just needs to be as long as your story should be. But Perfect. don't think about length when you're writing. Thank you. I think that's such a great response. Again, uh, OK, great. Divya has a question. Uh, I'm sorry, good question. Is the book considered for editing if the story is really promising, but the language isn't polished? What matters and comes first, the plot or the language? Only the plot. Only and absolutely the plot. The plot, the characters, the story you're telling. Language is very manageable. The other thing, of course, which again, because things are that the story you're telling wouldn't be the story that you're telling unless you were using the language that you're using. So, I mean, yeah, polished as far as articles and prepositions and quotation marks are concerned, sure, that's, that's the most fixable part of anything. And really, no editor cares about those things when they, we're reading a manuscript. You know, so which is why editors become slightly psychotic people, because at one point when you're reading the manuscript, your brain is deliberately geared to not noticing these things. On the other hand, when you're sending the book to press, your brain is geared to only noticing those things. But yeah, wow. just just don't bother about those things when you're submitting a manuscript. <clears throat> All right, great. Uh, Arun, your question is not very clear. It says, I always listen about discipline. Can you please elaborate? Is it writing or style of writing? Can you rephrase the question and post it again? I'm moving to the next one. Vidya says, if authors move with editors, what happens to book series when they start in one publishing house? Is that done? Um, the series wouldn't move. And again, authors move with editors is a very generic comment right i mean yeah. it happens but it also doesn't happen for example um like 
like I'm sure you guys know recently that Westland, uh, you know, Amazon disinvested in Westland. So Westland spent some time floating around before it was got into an association with Pratilipi, which was a very interesting thing to observe if any of you are industry observers, because for a while um, there were many books without a publishing house attached to them. They were essentially on the free market available. So, and, and authors who were, you know, they, they had nothing to be loyal to anymore. So people did a variety of things. Uh, some authors immediately found another publishing house to go to. Um, this was, The gap was about a week. The, the thing happened quite fast. Um, and uh, some authors chose to stick on with their publisher, with their current editors, despite the uncertainty of not knowing how Pratilipi Westland would work. Um, so yeah, it's it's very subjective. Um, and, and sometimes you tell authors also that, you know, you should stay on where you are because, for example, when I moved from Scholastic to um, Amachitra Katha, both have very different publishing agendas. And it just yeah. didn't make sense for uh, authors to move. You know, so I was very touched by the fact that they said that they were willing to move, but it just didn't make sense. Yeah, yeah. But if Fair you're doing much. a series, you have to stick on, unless, yeah. you know. Perfect. And Nanya has a question which has already answered about children's books in terms of readers' ages. Um, Zahara is saying, how does one stay in touch with you? Are you active on any social media platform? Or uh, would you, is there an email address that we can share in the group? Yeah, uh, I I'm most responsive on email. Actually, it's my name Sh Shayoni with a Q in the middle. Basu at gmail dot com. I can just type it actually. Yeah, if you can share it with us, we'll put yeah. it in the WhatsApp group also, and we'll have it yeah. here. Dave, if you can yeah. copy it, put it in the WhatsApp group, then I think that would be great for everyone to have. And thank you so much. That's really gracious of you to yeah. share it with all of us. Um, hey, I make my living off writers. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay. Uh, Arun has another question. Uh, while editing books after accepting for publication, do editors check only story or marketing angle as well? So do you get involved in the marketing or is that something completely different? Well, uh, it is, uh, again, it, 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 it varies from book to book and publishing house to publishing house. Uh, at Duckwell, we did our own marketing. So obviously one was very involved. Uh, in, okay, how many of you guys have penguin associations? I was going to say a very bitchy story. Um, okay, I'll say it anyway. When I joined Penguin, we had a really incompetent marketing department. So one had to try to be more involved. Now we have a superlative marketing department, so I have very little to do with it. They they talk, they ask, they ask very intelligent questions and they know what they're doing. So yes, the active marketing is done by your, by the marketing department. But often an author feels close to the editor because, you know, they work together on the book. So um, editors do occasionally get involved as well. But again, as I said, currently I am I have very minimal engagement simply because there is a superlative team in place. All right, great. That's helpful. That's good to know that, you know, there's there's a professional setup in Penguin for book marketing. Shukrita, you have a question. Is there a list of illustrators for children's books in India? How do you find children's books illustrators in India? I'm going to take that one, Shayoni. Go to the HimalayanWritingRetreat.com. Go and search for children's books illustrators in India. You will find a list of about 30 of them. Uh, Riddhi, next question. Can I add, will a manage... go to, yes, go to bookshops and see what you like. Ah. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that makes, that makes a lot of sense, too. Uh, uh, next question is from Riddhi. Will a manuscript for Duckbill um, whole or hook books not need chapters? So hook books don't have chapters because they're about 700 words long. Whole books do have chapters and they're about 5,000 words long. All right. Uh, then Varsha has a question. Do you have any suggestions to improve the odds of hearing back from editors when sending unsolicited manuscripts i think uh, remind them because uh, all editors intend to read manuscripts uh, it 
it just makes financial sense for us to read manuscripts because that's where we get books from. Um, however, um, I can I can sadly confess that why why occasionally I respond to manuscripts within hours. There are also times when I haven't responded to manuscripts for a very, very long time, simply because it's come in when I'm busy and I have forgotten completely about it. So be polite in your reminders. Uh, don't remind after a week, but please do remind. It's, uh, I mean, there have been books I have published where I have forgotten to read the manuscript. The author has reminded me, reminded me in a window where I wasn't doing something else. I have read the manuscript immediately and you know, wanted to publish it. So just remind. All right. No, Good. no editor, no editor resents that unless you're doing it once a <laughs> week. Sure. Great. Um, the Gayatri has a question. How are graphic novels or similar illustrated format books judged for publishing? I'm not sure how you mean judged. Is, does the genre sell? Is that what you're asking? I would imagine. Go ahead. The genre. See, the, the good thing is in children, in all books, yeah, uh, the numbers for India are not very high. So in a sense, we do have flexibility to publish experimental stuff, even if you're not completely convinced of how they will sell, as long as you can make the basic margins, because you obviously have to pay the printer, you have to pay the designers and all of that. So if you expect the book to sell below that, then okay, you're not going to publish it. But other than that, if your book is high quality, even if there is no guarantee of huge sales, as long as nobody is losing money over it, most publishers are willing to give it a shot, if it's a good book. Right. Uh, great. Next two uh, questions are sort of related, so I'm going to read them out together. Uh, what differences do you see in India vis-a-vis -vis the West or East Asia in children's books? And Ridu has a question saying, how often do Indian books make it to the international markets? And are these books um, marketed more? Uh, I'm reading Moin and the Monster, and it's such an amazing book. But it's strange that I'm only hearing about this book now. So both are really trying to figure out you know, the market for India and how the kids' book work across borders. So, so the news here is not good. Uh, because while qualitatively, I think a lot of Indian books are really, really good. Um, there is a certain lack of receptivity to um, Indian books in the international market. Uh, the younger the book is, um, like picture books, uh, could still sell what a lot of international publishers, and I am talking largely Western here, are looking for uh, folk tales and mythology and very typical tales of Amma's pallu sweeping your brow as she gives you a tilka laddu. Okay, uh, so, so, so there is a slightly stereotypical notion of India, which is, uh, which international publishers are often looking for. Um, the other, the the other reason possibly because, um, like, you know, things which we consider difficult books in India now for kids, like books about homosexuality or uh, abuse or things like that, um, we are a little bit late to the party in terms of the international book market. And really, um, the so, so it's like this. The best books which talk about these things in a manner which works for Indian readers may not always work for international readers because they're not coming with the same set of experiences. And when you read about, you know, books, I'm, I'm just going to keep saying Indian, books with Indian setting being published in the US or doing really well in the US, the one thing you will notice is that they're invariably about Indian origin kids growing up in the US, because that is what people identify with. Mm. So there was a recent very interesting discussion um, at um, the Neve Literature Festival, where they got the editor of this imprint of Penguin called Kokila Books, which is supposed to be books by people of color. So the imprint is dedicated to that. All their staff are non-white, and they're just supposed to be more sensitive and receptive to stories. Um, 
again, if you look at their list, they're all talking about, uh, you know, kids of different shades of skin tone in the US. So depending mm. on the kind of book you're writing, your chances of publishing internationally are um, reasonable to nil. Having said which, there are again agents who agents currently in India who sell books internationally. Not very many of them do children's books. It's it's a rare, rare one. You know, for example, I oh, yeah. hmm? I published a book called Zen. No, um, go. Yeah, which is is which is I think one of the best young adult novels. Um, it's it's by Shabnam Minwala, and. I felt that we really needed to get the book out there, so I asked her to. Um, so, so she, I worked directly with her, but I asked her for foreign rights to go to an agent uh, because I felt he would have a better chance of selling the book than I would. And um, it hasn't sold. I'm not saying that it won't sell, but if you write picture books or books for younger readers and you want to sell abroad, then I would suggest you publish either with Tara or Kara details. Because Shobha, Vishwanath, and Geeta Wolf are complete international rights sales machines. I respect them very highly for it. And you should look at it. Awesome. That's, uh, that's so much value. Thank you. Okay, just a uh, last couple of questions. We are running really low on time. But uh, I will take them nonetheless. First is from Nanya. She's saying, "How do you, do you send the whole manuscript in one go, or just um, a few chapters when you're pitching her for the first time? When you're pitching for but, the first time, um, you should. You, most publishers have what they want on their website, um, yeah. so you should have a look. <laughs> Typically, synopsis and um, uh, a couple of chapters is good, but it's also good if you do this after you finish writing the full manuscript." Because then you know exactly what you're writing about. And also, then when the publisher says, oh, I like the first three chapters, send it in. You can send it in immediately rather than wait nine months, by which time the publisher has forgotten about it again. Yeah, cool. Can I tell uh, you three things other... not to do? OK. Don't tell any editor that your niece and nephew loved it. Uh, we don't care. They love you, they love your book. Uh, don't send your photograph. Uh, even if you're really good looking, not going to sway it. Uh, I think those were the two, actually. All right, great. Remember the third one, then come back and tell us. Well, actually, I was uh... going to say don't send your CV. That is also not relevant. But it's OK if you write a couple of lines. But don't, don't send your CV. I mean, an author bio is useful. I think a professional CV of having you know expertise in SAP probably is useless. Look, no, I don't know. I mean, again, it, it's also subjective, you know. I mean, some editors might read it. I can tell you honestly that when I'm sent a profile, I just don't open it, which occasionally okay. leads to very embarrassing things because I published this author and it's only after a book was all, when I was, after we did the contract and I was trying to pay her money that I realized she was 16. Oh, wow. I didn't read her bio. I just read the synopsis and I asked and the sample chapters and asked for the whole book. Manuscript. That was it. Brilliant. All right. Uh, and last question. Um, how do you rate book success in terms of sales for sales in India for a children's market book? So if you if you're Ruskin Bond or Sudha Murthy, then I think you you would rate success at uh, 50,000 copies. If you're not Ruskin Bond or Sudha Murthy, then uh, I think 7,000 is a good number. Having said which, not very many books reach 7,000. But, right. but, mean... but, but, but there's a difference, OK? Adult books sell, adult books peak early and then wear off or continue. Children's books take a very, very long time to peak. Typically, a book will sell its most in the third year. Oh wow! At least, that was, I, I mean, I'm not sure whether that's the thing with Penguin, but at Duckbill we observed that because because as someone said earlier, I haven't heard of Moin. It's because there are no review spaces for kids' books. Okay, um, so nobody knows what's being published. It's a dark, dark secret. Um, 
and it takes about three years for people to find out what has been published. So oh then, okay, yeah, okay, interesting, great. Well, thank you so much, Shayoni. It's been absolutely fabulous talking to you.